Jeff Immelt is the former CEO of GE. He served in that role from September 2001 until summer of 2017. Now, Jeff Immelt, for a lot of folks, they pointed to him as the person to blame for GE's challenges and its decline. He acknowledges that while his legacy was controversial and that his tenure had ended badly, he is here for the first time to share his side of the story in a new book called Hot Seat, a memoir of leadership in times of crisis. Jeff, uh, welcome. And uh, as I was just referencing uh, the book you wrote, you were talking about how a lot of folks really blamed you for what happened to GE and that you're here sharing your story for the first time. And it seems that there are two kind of conflicting storylines that you got dealt a really bad hand. Then, then the other storyline is that you made a lot of mistakes what happened to GE? Well, look, I, I think, Julia, I'd put it, I, again, this wasn't my attempt to tell my side of the story. It was really an attempt to tell a, a more complete story about GE, both for the people that I worked with, but also to kind of talk to leaders about how to manage through crisis. Uh, on one side of the ledger, uh, the company had record earnings. Our businesses were market leaders. We developed a lot of good leaders. We had good initiatives. Uh, you know, G was an admired company in 2017. G was number seven on Fortune uh, list of most admired companies. The other side of the ledger is, you know, like the stock didn't work. Um, G capital over 15 or 16 years. We just weren't able to generate the kind of value we should have through that. And at the end, I really gave the, the company and the board too many things to work on. But I wanted to tell a more complete story about the company, Julia, just to, just to really on behalf of the people that I worked with. We'll start to get into that as well. And, you know, some of the things that stood out to me in, in the book, Jeff, is just, you know, how um, straightforward you were with how you felt. Um, for example, when you um, left the company in the summer of 2017 and that stock price went up and you, you stayed quiet for several years. You didn't criticize the new leadership. And uh, you talked about how some folks would say, hey, you must have really uh, thick skin, but even having thick skin, it doesn't, uh, I guess, protect you from the haters or, or having certain kind of feelings. What was that like for you going through that? And why did you feel the need to speak out now? What was the impetus for it? Yeah, you know, people always talk about, said to me, you must have thick skin, but nobody has thick skin. They, they just choose to take a certain path. Um, I love the company. I tried my best. Some things worked, some things didn't. I own the things that didn't work. When I left the company, I needed time and space to heal. Uh, I moved to the West Coast. I started working with small companies. I started teaching. It just gave me time to reflect and to think. Over the course of that time, Julia, I, I've had a chance to watch the way the company's been covered. It just hasn't been complete and it hasn't been fair. And I, I think I owe it to my colleagues to give them, to paint a more complete picture of a complicated situation, but a company where people really did their best every day. And that's what I've tried to do in Hot Seat. Really, and Julia, in Hot Seat, I'm harder on myself than I am on anybody else. I'm very, very reflective and self-critical as I should be, but I, I want the people that I worked with to be proud of the things they did. You know, um, I, you were there for what, 35 years. Um, a lot of folks will find out that you actually have the tattoo of the uh, GE logo. It's called the meatball. Um, I think it was on your left hip. You got that in 2005 and you're just kind of talking about wanting to tell them more complete story. And you often would ask people, you know, tell me something about GE that I don't know. Obviously, you know the company well. Tell our viewers something about this company that they don't know. Oh, look, I think GE got to a lot of important initiatives before others. Uh, we developed, I think, the strongest global footprint, the strongest global framework. We invested in digital technologies long before others did. Uh, we had really groundbreaking businesses and life sciences and renewable energies. I, I took the advantage, Julia, in one page at the end of chapter 11, I kind of said, here's what I'd like you to know about GE. Because again, I didn't want the book to seem defensive, but I did want to leave the reader with the perspective that it's not all bad, that this is a company that did a lot of th uh, good things. And that's, that's what I hope people can recognize as they read the book. 
Mm -hmm. We should talk about um, your predecessor, Jack Welch. And I, I mean, it's interesting. I think a lot of folks kind of had this view of him. Uh, he was named manager of the century uh, in the year 2000. Um, he spent two decades there, kind of like I kind of, I don't know if he became the first celebrity CEO, but at least one that was very well recognized a household name yet. Um, you address his less than perfect legacy and you talk about him being a hero to you. You felt that, but obviously that relationship evolved over time, maybe a little, I don't know if um, the word is contentious, but definitely sometimes where he would say things publicly about you. Talk to us about the evolution of that relationship with Jack Welch. Yeah, great leader uh, of his time. Um, I, I loved working for him. He was fun. He was interesting. He was challenging. But the world really changed around the time that Jack retired. It became more technical, more global, more social, more transparency. And so the GE that I was leading in the 21st century was very different than the GE that he led for a long time. Um, you know, it was a complicated relationship in that he he wasn't always necessarily supportive when I needed him. But anytime I was in a pinch, he was a person that I called. You know, in 2009, we had to face the decision to cut the dividend. It was one of the hardest decisions I ever made. And despite the fact that we were at a, a, a difficult position in our relationship, he was the first guy I called. So I valued him. Um, all the time that we coexisted. And I have to say, Julia, when he died, I was extremely sad. And I was particularly sad to see, see the way he was covered uh, in, in the terms of, for somebody that did so many good things, I, I thought the retrospective uh, wasn't quite fair. And I, I think, Julia, what we, you know, we just live in a hater's world. There's a world without nuance today. And it, it's okay for somebody to be really good and not perfect. And that was uh, that was Jack. He was really great, but he wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, you did bring up some moments in the book, including him going on, he went on CNBC and criticized you um, for yeah. facing earnings. Said he, you know, I think he said he'd get a gun out or something. And I mean, talk to us about why you were sharing those moments as well. Did paint a different side um, of Jack Welch that maybe not everyone got to see. Yeah, you know, Julia, so when I, I wrote the book, I had 75 people be interviewed. And what I tried to do was paint a complete picture of, you know, what I did, why I did it, and how I felt. And so in order to do that kind of review, you have to talk about some things that are painful and, and maybe bring them up for the first time. Really, for most of, really, my whole life, my whole career, my whole time as CEO, I never really said anything negative about him because I felt like that was important for the G family. But, you know, in the, in the space of time, what I wanted to do here was tell a complete story, the good and the bad. And, and really, you know, the vast majority of stories I tell are great about people. And I think you can see by the stories I tell about Jack, how much I loved him and respected him. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the other uh, areas that you, you explore in, in the book, and, including, um, you know, I guess after you left and you, again, you kept quiet, but you did share some of the stories, um, you know, kind of leading up to the moment that you decided to leave and then the company um, even after. So I guess in the lead up here, um, you talked about, you know, even contemplating resigning during the recession and also, you know, but also toward the end, I guess, around the time of um, the Alstrom deal, wanting more time from the board. Talk to us about that kind of thought process. And do you think if you left earlier, things would have been different? Or do you think, uh, how do you think things would have been different if you got more time? Yeah, look, I mean, I think the, um, during the financial crisis, it's, you know, we live in COVID today and COVID has been a horrible time for the world and for business and for leaders and CEOs. The financial crisis for a, a time period of, you know, six months or nine months, it just were really debilitating. And it was completely, I, I would say, keeping your head up during that time was really critical. And after we cut the dividend in 2009, I considered retiring at that point, just, just because the energy that would take to bring the company back was something that I thought would be, you know, I just want to make sure that I had that in me uh, to get through it. And then at the end, you, you know, really it was, 
it was hard to kind of say what was the right time to leave. I think if I had left in 2015, after we announced Project Hubble with GE Capital, you know, things would certainly have been different and better for me. But, you know, I, I didn't really think about it at that time. And, you know, it just was given the events of around 2017 and 16, um, it was just a difficult transition time for the board and for me. And, um, you know, we did the best we could, but it didn't work the way any of us would have wanted it to. How about after you left with the new um, management team in, in place, John Flannery? I, I didn't stay very long, but uh, what went wrong there? You did talk about kind of this company, and it was a, I think the quote was a define, people created a culture defined by victimhood. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I, I think with, with John, I created lots of problems for John. I own that. I, I supported John and I wanted him to do well. Um, he had to deal with things that, that really I, I had hoped we wouldn't leave. But at the same time, I think the job was to lead the company forward. And I, I rooted for John. I, I hoped he was successful. But frequently, kind of inside the company, it just seemed from the outside things were coming apart and it ended faster for him than certainly any of us wanted. But, but I own a piece of that and, and, and need to be very forthright in that respect. Mm -hmm. I guess like I have kind of a question just about GE and I'm trying to understand it. Why do you think there's so much emotion around the company? There's, it just seems like it, there's so much emotion around it. Why do you think that is? A lot of folks really care about it. And a lot of folks, you know, have been following the story and uh, a lot of folks have been very critical of it as well. Why is there the emotion? Yeah, look, it's, I think the good part about the company is it's been an important company for a long time. It's been a place that's developed leaders. It's been a place that's gotten things, uh, gotten first to some key initiatives and, and launched them. It's been a part of the, you know, kind of American business story for a long time. So I think people care about that and they're, and, and they're, they have every right to be uh, supportive and or critical if that's what they choose, because that's, the, it's been a high profile company. So I, I think that just comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in the book a few, uh, it was that you gave a list of some of the mistakes that you made, you own your mistakes. Um, I guess kind of looking back, Jeff, what would you say would be your biggest regret? You know, Julia, I would say, again, I, I go all the way back in time. I had a choice right after 9-11 to reset the company to really invest hard on, an, on the industrial side and slow down the GE capital growth at that time. I, I made a choice to allow financial services to continue to grow and, and while reinvesting in the industrial side. And by 2007 or 2008, that didn't look very smart when we got to the financial crisis. And, and so I, I'd say that was probably, you know, the most seismic Error. And I think what you can learn from that is that for any CEO or any leader, take the time sometimes to go slow and think very long term about your company. And, and I think I, I, I was thinking kind of coming out of 9-11, maybe too short term versus really thinking about, you know, five or 10 years down downstream. We mm -hmm. paid a price for that. The, the financial crisis was a very challenging time for GE because we were a big finance company, big wholesale funded finance company. And that was what really got destroyed uh, during the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. You're just kind of mentioning the, the short termism. I, that, I, I think probably a lot of folks do talk about this in, in corporate America and um, kind of the challenges that come with that. And take us inside a GE, especially if you're talking about things like, you know, innovation, for example, and it sounded like, you know, I think you, you kind of pointed, you cited uh, Clay Christensen's innovator's dilemma, like how difficult that yeah. was. Share with us how difficult it was. I'll tell you a story that worked and one that didn't, uh, Joy. You know, one that worked was aviation. You, you know, every time the chips were down, you know, particularly in like, uh, like a time right after 9-11 or 2008, 2009, we doubled down on technology. We increased the number of engines we, we introduced. And so over the course of 20 years, that's been a very successful business, but only because we focused on the long-term and made the key investments. If I go to the G Digital uh, kind of innovation, we invested a lot. 
it was it took time to come to market and at the end of the day we ended up pulling the plug on that but others have pursued it right so uh one of our peers at the time we launched the product was c3 ai they just went public they've got a 15 billion dollar market cap so you know that those are things you just have to stay the course on these big investments and that's hard with a, a you know kind of a legacy public company but that's the way you win Mm -hmm. Well, I guess kind of speaking of legacy public companies and, you know, kind of newer players, we should talk about what you're doing these days. You are uh, working in venture capital and advising CEO. So what do you tell the kind of next generation CEO and how, how do you think your time at GE shapes the way you advise them? Yeah, so there's, you know, again, I, I wanted to work with small companies again. I, I wanted to work with innovators and small companies. And I'd say there's two parts of my experience that are useful to an entrepreneur. One is I've seen crisis. So particularly in COVID, I can be a useful coach about the need to kind of, for a leader to absorb fear, to really hold, you know, kind of two truths and that good things can happen and bad things can happen, uh, be a good communicator. And, and those are awfully useful. And then the other thing is to teach them how to scale. You know, I would say the one thing that I learned from uh, Jack Welch that he was fantastic was about leading a, a company at scale. So how do you hire managers? How do you build the right kind of cohorts? How do you invest in human resources talent? Those are things that are extremely useful to, uh, to entrepreneurs. So I'd say those are useful. And, and the last thing is, you know, Julia, having done the job for a long time, I know a lot of people I can open up doors and I'm always happy to help them sell or think through different relationships and partnerships. So I think that's helpful as well. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the other things you brought up in the book was just kind of the the role luck plays for a, a CEO. How much do you think luck really played, um, you know, in for you or I guess maybe bad luck? How much did that play a role in, in, in your own experiences and, and, and how do you well, kind of... I think, Julie, it's certain that I didn't get a lot of good luck, you, you know, but not that I, you know, I made my own mistakes. So I can't blame, I can't blame timing and things like that. But luck does matter. You know, if you, if you think about COVID, Go back a year ago or go back to, to the beginning of 2000. Zoom was a pretty good company on, on kind of video conferencing. Delta Airlines was a great airline. Uh, Delta Airlines has been hit hard by COVID and Zoom has Zoomed. Uh, now that's luck, right? That's, that's Delta is a great, a well-managed airline and Zoom is a really interesting, te good technology. But one was helped by the crisis, one was hurt. And I just think, you know, there's no, there's no way to protect against that. You just need to be uh, leaders that can absorb fear and continue going. And I, I think today, you know, all, all leadership is crisis leadership and people have to learn to value progress and not perfection. Fair point as well. Um, so what do you think, uh, what do you think Jack Welch would think of your book if he were um, alive today to read it? What do you think his reaction might be having known him for so long? I, I really don't think about it. I really don't know. You know, in other words, I, I, um, I really respect the guy. I really liked him. I loved working for him. But over the arc of my life, I stopped really caring that much about what he thought about me. And in some ways, that was the only way I could work. It was the only way I could lead is just do it my way have my thoughts, be transparent about it, value what I learned from him, but lead my own life. How do you think that applies to kind of the next generations of leadership, Larry Culp, who's there now, I guess, how much do you kind of follow the GE story? And do you see a path forward for GE? And if so, what do you think that is? Yeah, look, I, I, um, I, I cheer for Larry. I still own a lot of stock. I want him to do well. He's a great operator. The company has strong positions in three essential sectors, which is aviation, power, and healthcare. And so there's plenty of work to be done in those three sectors. And, you know, that's kind of where I see G going in the future and, and, and really cheer Larry on as he, as he tackles it and approaches it. I still know there's a lot of people in the GE community that cheer for the company and want the company to do well. And I put myself at the top of that list. And I suppose uh, one final question for you, Jeff, before I let you go is you're just talking again about how 
the story has been reported incompletely and at times untruthfully. So you say you take no pleasure in, in telling, but people deserve to know what really happened. So I suppose in kind of summarizing it for folks, um, if you, I guess you had to put your finger on what, what ultimately was the root cause. Oh, you mean of the, of the company today? Look, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's complicated, really. I, I would say um, uh, we never really totally got through the exit of financial services. That created a strain on the company. Uh, tough in use markets. Um, you know, again, I, I, I own those things. Uh, and a lot that the leadership team and the board had to work on uh, at the end of my tenure. But you know, there's still a ton of good people at the company. There's really strong businesses and there's no reason why the company can't do well in the future. And again, I, I would come back to say all leadership is crisis leadership. And, and that really is one of the things that I want people to get out of the book. Jeff Immel is the former CEO of GE and the author of the new book, Hot Seat a memoir of leadership in times of crisis. Jeff Immel, I thank you so much for your Thanks time. You. Thanks, good to be with you.